Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, everybody. Thank you again for joining me today. We have a great topic this week, which of course I do say that every week, don't I? But we are talking about death with dignity and dementia. With me is D. I should have asked how to pronounce the last name. Is it Lieberhart? Yeah, Liebhart. Liebhart. Okay, I added extra syllable, syll- uh, syllable in there. She is the author of House on Fire, which is an amazing book. It is fiction based on reality. And so I'm going to let her introduce herself and we're going to talk a little bit about the book and she's got some strong opinions on death with dignity and dementia. So thanks for joining me, Dee. Well, thanks so much for having me. So uh, you, you pretty much introduced me already, but I am a registered nurse. Uh, so I do, the character in the book is somewhat based on my family. Of course, a lot of things in the book happened that didn't happen. Um, and uh, the nurse in the The book is an ICU nurse. I'm a former ICU nurse. I'm not an ICU nurse anymore. My dad did have dementia for 10 years. uh, So that's kind of where it informed all the dementia aspects of the book. Did you have strong feelings about death with dignity before your dad's diagnosis and the conversations you had with your mom that prompted the book? Um, I think that as a nurse, I think it's an area that you're 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 exposed to probably a little bit more uh, than other people. And I think particularly ICU nursing, and this is something that I really try to do in the book, uh, is this conflict that I, ICU nurses are in, which is often being asked to pr- maintain life when you as a nurse are looking at a situation that you think is hopeless. Um, so being put in a code situation where you're coding someone that you already know is going to die, uh, but because of either the family's misunderstanding or how sudden it happened or things like that, that you're in that situation. And so I really, that was one of the things I like to juxtapose in the book was this, you know, nurse who has this thing that they do at work that's going one way. And then this request at home, which is the mother asks uh, the, the, the daughter to euthanize her father because he's suffering from dementia. Um, so I would say that I didn't have, I, I, I don't even know that I have strong opinions now so much for other people, but just kind of strong opinions about what should be allowed, I guess. Yeah. Well, my feeling is, and we were talking about this before I hit record. So for her, this is a repeat, <laughs> but I have always felt, so I am 57. I have no concerns about my brain health at this point. Um, most listeners should know that my mom had dementia for 20 years. My maternal grandmother had mixed dementias, probably, which also probably included Alzheimer's. My maternal great-grandmother also had dementia. Yay for my family history. Um, hopefully I do take after my dad's side of the family. <laughs> but I feel like I should be able to go to either my general physician or a neurologist, a psychologist, and a lawyer and basically say, I'm of sound mind um, and body, I guess that's important. And under these circumstances, I should be allowed to be euthanized, kind of like I've had to do with numerous dogs in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then after going through the entire journey with my mom, she never got to the bed bound, having to be fed and changed stage. It's really hard to like say, yeah, she got to the point. Yeah, that's the point where I, you know, pull a plug. It's hard Mm -hmm. enough to do on a poor dog, which Mm -hmm. we literally today is actually February 29th. Um, we lost a dog just a, just a couple days over a year ago. And it's really hard to like, mm. Mm, yep, nope, now it's time. And I can't imagine actually pulling that trigger with my mom. So, you know, I have opinions, but I don't know that I'd actually act on them. <laughs> well, and I, and I think that, you know, certainly in the United States, we're not even close to this conversation, right? Because no. death with dignity, even with terminal illness, is only legal, I think, in 10 states. Um, and so that's the first step, right? So the first step is just the idea of death, the dignity, which in most states means that a physician provides you with the medications for you to do, you know, to commit suicide yourself. You usually have to have a terminal illness um, of some kind or and or the definition of terminal illness is like six months to live. So it depends on what the, the laws are. So I think that we're pretty far from the idea that, you know, someone with dementia um, could 
you know, be euthanized, though the Netherlands has made made some inroads into that. Um, and typically in the Netherlands, it is people who have dementia in the early stages where they're still able to make those decisions for themselves, making that choice. Um, but there's a fairly big case in the Netherlands where uh, completely in line with like what you're talking about. So someone had made an advanced directive that said that this is what they wanted. And in 2016, and, and a physician uh, did did uh, do euthanize someone. So euthanize is when a physician does that. That is legal in some respects, um, in some instances in the Netherlands. Um, and he did that per the patient's request from the past, but now they had advanced dementia where they could no longer agree to it. And it became a pretty big court case um, in the Netherlands in 2020, I think it was 2020, when they finally decided that he hadn't done anything wrong and that they basically, you know, reinforced the idea that that was allowed. But it, it's, it, it's, you know, it's not, it's not easy moral territory or ethical territory. It's definitely, you know, a, a, a conversation. I, and I think that the most important thing to me, and I, and I guess why I say I don't have strong opinions or I don't want to have strong opinions is because I think the conversation is the most important part. I think that we as a society don't, have these challenging conversations because we have strong opinions. And so we don't allow someone else the space to have those opinions. Um, and I think those are the conversations we're gonna need to have in order to kind of figure out where, we, where we're okay, what we're okay with. It's gonna be a lot of conversations on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I know people who are like, they, they struggle with an aging dog. It's like, yeah, the dog can barely stand up, barely can take care of business. And, you know, it's like, it's time to pull the plug. You know, the dog mm -hmm. is suffering. <laughs> and so it's, I can only imagine trying to make that decision for a spouse or a parent or other family member. Um, was it the government that went after the doctor or did the family object? Uh, yeah. No, actually it was the family. The family was involved in the, the situation where the patient was euthanized. So I think that there was just some question about whether the, the patient could, could change their mind, right? So did they have dementia, so they're no longer competent, but then they've changed their mind, you know? And I think it, I think it does bring up some really interesting questions because as a nurse, you know, something that we talk about, like, you know, if we have a patient with dementia or a, a brain injury, we don't force them to do certain things that may be in their best interest, right? So we don't force them to take a shower. We don't force them to wear a particular set of clothes or something like that. We only force them, and, I, and that's not the right word, right? But we only make them do certain things that are required for survival. So taking their medications um, and then eating and drinking. They can make a decision about eating or drinking to a certain degree. And then at some point, someone else gets involved where it's like, okay, if this person is not eating or drinking, are we going to, you know, put in an NG tube, which is a tube down your nose to feed you? And then are we going to put in a permanent tube, you know, into your stomach that we're going to feed you through? So those start being those complicated questions. And I think even more so for me as a nurse, that the more important conversations are, are just all of those conversations about death um, and all of those conversations about like, if you had dementia, you know, would you, what would you want? Where would you want to live? What would you want me to do? And I, I, I'll, it's something that's in the book that's like very powerful, like important to me, right? Um, is that whole idea of not putting someone in a nursing home. Um, because that is, as far as I understand, a, a promise that, and I'm going to actually cry probably, um, a promise that my parents made to each other that my mother was unable to keep. And when my dad became, uh, dangerous. So some of that is is accurate. That's in the book. Um, my dad was still very physically strong. Um, and so he would wander off in the middle of the night. Um, he would do all of those things that are in the book. And my mom ultimately kind of to keep herself safe and also sane, um, ended up putting him in assisted living. And I kind of thought that we had made peace with that. I thought that it was okay. Uh, because I saw it from the perspective of my mom having lost five years of her life already to taking care of my dad and knowing that my dad wouldn't have wanted that for my mom. Uh, and at the same time, knowing that that was a promise that they made to each other. And I thought it was okay until I was taking care of my mom as she died. And one of the last conversations we had was basically how she had never forgiven herself for that. And I was, mm -hmm. I was just absolutely like almost shocked um, because it was still something that pained her so much 
so I think that's that's one of the reasons I think it's so important to have these conversations and and be realistic about these conversations um, because I don't believe that my dad ha- again had he known he would have said oh of course put me in a home just leave me there and go go bowling you know he would have wanted her to her to live he wouldn't have wanted her to have sacrificed her whole life where she couldn't go and do anything um, because she had to watch him you know 24 7. And my mom always said, I don't want to be a burden to you two girls. I'm going to live forever in my home. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> those are polar opposites. Right. Neither right. of those things are going to be true. Mm-hmm. And we never had the car. So my dad had diabetes. He'd had a transplanted kidney. Still didn't take that great care of it. Um, knew that he didn't want to go back on dialysis. And his nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor for those not in the know, um, She also knew he didn't want to go back on dialysis. And had I known what was going on with him, I would never have taken him to the hospital. But I didn't know. Um, We showed up for a visit and he thought it was 1998. And and this was 2016. And I was like, oh, my God, I've got Mm -hmm. two parents with no brains. Now what? But we never had a conversation about what would happen if he died first, which, you know, he was two years older and he was not healthy. that That was a seriously missed opportunity. And it was while he was home on hospice that I found out from his friend, my dad just assumed my mom would come live with me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was like, um, first off I had just turned 50. My daughter had just moved out and I was like, no, I've been mentally preparing for empty nest and (laughs) thank, thank you. But I plan on (laughs) having a life. Right. Well that, and it's like, I did portrait photography. My studio was attached to my house. I had clients in, I went out to the gym or out cycling with a bike club. I'm like, I would have to have a caregiver here with her during the day. She also had a dog that I had a golden retriever that did not like to get more than a foot away from me. And he hated my mom's dog so bad that Mm. he would literally go sleep outside Mm -hmm. until she left. It was the dog made everything 10 times more challenging. And you couldn't remind my mother that you fed her three times today. The dog is double what she should weigh. And like, you know, there was no logic. And so it was just like, this isn't going to work because while my dad was in the hospital, my mom went from my house to my sister's house. And then her sister with my aunt would be in my parents' home taking care of my mom. And when she was at my house, it was obvious that she instinctively knew she was still the mom. Cause she was not mm-hmm. taking instructions, suggestions, yeah gentle nudging it was it would have been a battle i'm like there is no way this woman can live with me because in a week one or both of us will be dead Mm -hmm. yeah um but moving her into memory care was awful Mm -hmm. she did finally adapt after about six weeks i was beginning to think the executive director of the community was insane because he kept telling me she'll keep she'll be fine she'll be fine i was like no this is a horrible nightmare yeah (laughs) And she ended up with friends. It ended up to be a very, a very positive situation. Um, You know, they still don't have enough staff and there there was not enough training. There's, there's definite room for improvement Mm -hmm. for memory care, but yeah, you know, it just, you know, after she, she, she fell and broke her leg, which was the last off her body. The reason that happened was because she was getting combative Mm -hmm. and wouldn't, it took two of them to, get her showered twice a week. Mm -hmm. Now, if they'd had more staff and more training, that scenario probably could have been avoided. And if I had known it was only three years between my father's death and my mother's death, I'm like, yeah, maybe I would have had her at home. So Mm -hmm. I still play that what if game. I'm like, no, she was happy. Everything was fine. (laughs) Well, and I think that's, you know, I think everybody does that what if game, right? You always, you're always sort of I think so, you know, looking to fix the story. And I had um, a conversation like you and I spoke about, um, you know, my mother chose to commit suicide. I, I hate, I hate to say that word because it, you know, it's, it, but that's basically what it was. You know, my mother chose to end her life through starving herself um, after suffering a stroke. Um, and after, you know, one of the things I think, and I, and I would say like one of the things that the gift that my mother gave me and my brother, and I had a physician point this out to me, um, was that my mother made all the decisions, all these terrible, horrible decisions, she made herself. Uh, And so she, it was very clear 
uh, that she want what she wanted. And, you know, my brother and I didn't try to talk her out of it. She and my mother and I had a very, very brief conversation. So what happened, you know, was it was during the pandemic and my mother and I had already spoken um, early on. I had said, you know, uh, if you get COVID, do you want to go to the hospital? Um, because my mother was 83. She was living by herself. Um, and I said, you, you know, I said, I, I'm, I'll come out and I'll take care of you and we'll take our chances if you don't want to go to the hospital. And so that's what she said she wanted to do, that she, no way did she want to die in the hospital. That was, and like you said about your mom, she wanted to die in her house. Uh, and so I had, we'd already had that conversation early on. And then when my sister-in-law called to tell me that they were taking my mom to the hospital, that was my immediate thought, right? It was like, my mom had COVID. And then I found out it was a stroke that she had had, like they had a stroke. Um, and then I went out there and I was with my mom for what appeared like a, you know, a pretty basic stroke and then devolved over about five days to very, very significant deficits. Um, and over these five days, she and I had lots of conversations about her wanting to kill herself. Uh, and we, we, you know, we were talking about these things. And then when the morning woke, when she woke up and she couldn't move her left arm is what happened and she couldn't really walk. Um, and she just said, you know, that's it. I, I, I don't want it. She, I was giving her breakfast and she said, this is stupid. She said, I, this is just going to make it all last longer. And I mm. already knew what she wanted when I already knew what she was planning to do. I got her back in bed and basically the, the, the gist of the whole conversation was, I said, are you sure? And she said, yes. And I said, do you want to come and live with me? And, you know, and she said, no, not like this. And then you know, I said, I love you. And she said, I know. And that was it. And that was, the, that was it. That was the entire conversation. And I think the, that after the fact that what if, right, that was what you were talking about. Like I would do that over and over and over again. And my brother and I got in this big, long, I don't know, 30 minute conversation where I was like, what if I did this? And what if that? And he just stopped and he said, and mom would still be dead. Like no matter what you do, no matter what answer you come to, no matter how you, much you keep going through this story, at the end of the day, mom is still gone and it doesn't, you know, our, our what ifs don't matter. And I, that was really, you know, big for me because it was me. I was like, oh yeah, he's right. Like, this is just this game that my brain is playing. Like I can solve this puzzle and I can't, you know, there's no puzzle to be solved. It's done. So, Your mom must have had some, she had some oh. strong feelings about things. <laughs> She definitely did. She definitely did. And and I think, you know, my, she had made it very clear that she wanted to die at home, that she wanted to die in that house. And like you said, never, never having, never wanting to leave that home. And even, even when the stroke appeared to be minor, you know, I could see it like that. She was just like unhappy and didn't want, didn't want even these minor deficits. Uh, so, you know. Is it normal for a stroke to appear minor and then devolve? Because I've never really heard of that. I know. Well, so, okay, I'm a nurse. <laughs> I'm a nurse. And what I thought was happening, so she started out. So the important part is that my mother was not treated. So she did not get what's called reperfusion therapy. So reperfusion therapy is when you get to the hospital in a certain amount of time. This is why it's so important if someone has a stroke that they get to the hospital as quickly as possible. Because there's a window where a medication that actually breaks down clots can be given. If that medication is given or the clot is removed through a surgical procedure, then that area reperfuses. It gets blood again, it gets oxygen again, and it doesn't die. Um, and so that's, I think, what a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and so when I had taken my mom home um, from the hospital, and we'd had these minor deficits. I actually thought she was having a, a, a second stroke is what I thought was happening because we were having dinner the next day and I looked across and her face was drooping. And I was like, oh, terrific. And it was the opposite side, you know, oh, no. of where things had happened before. I was like, and, and the highest risk time for a second stroke is immediately after, you know, the first stroke. So I got my mom to the hospital, like, you know, really fast. Uh, and I, you know, got her in and they took her back to get a, you know, um, a scan. And then they came back out and I was like waiting for all this treatment. And then the doctor looked at me and said, I don't think this is a new stroke. I think it's the same stroke progressing across the midline, which is the divide in your brain, which is why it was appearing on a different side. And I, I, I just was like, what? 
Like I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, and they ended up readmitting my mother. And I went home and I called a friend who's a much more experienced nurse than I am. And I was like, what is he talking about? And basically it's the progression of the dying of the tissue. So the, the death of the tissue. So it wasn't this one time event. The, all these other tissues that were being impacted by that stroke were now dying and we're going to continue to die. And the, the, the thing that might have happened was there might've been some recovery after if my mom had waited. Um, but it's probably unlikely, uh, cause it's an untreated stroke. You usually get to like a, a kind of a bottom and then it's, especially at my mother's age. Um, if you're young, you know, you can recover all kinds of abilities. Um, but when you're older, there's a lot less uh, possibility. Yeah. So I was, I was absolutely, you know, just, I couldn't, I didn't understand what was happening. Yeah. That's interesting and, 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 and amazing in a lot of respects. Um, Cause like I'd never heard of somebody getting worse, but your explanation was excellent. So thank you for that. Did you guys after your, so your mom literally asked you to help your dad fulfill what he would have probably done if he'd had the ability no, so that, that no? definitely didn't happen. No, she didn't okay. ask me that with my dad. So she asked me to help her kill herself. Um, and But she had not asked me about my dad. My dad was the conversation that we had on a regular basis, which was where my mom would say one of two things, which was one, he didn't deserve this. Um, and that if he had known this was going to happen to him, he would have gone out in the backyard and blown his brains out. And that's the exact line that's in the book. Um, and so we would have that conversation on a regular basis. Uh, and I don't, you know, now in retrospect, uh, now looking at it, having gone through what I did with my mom, I don't know that that's true. I don't know. I, I believe it's true if it had been easy, uh, you know, for my dad to have killed himself, um, if he had known, if it had been simple, but the, it's actually fairly complicated. It's not this simple thing, right? Um, as I found out with my mother, um, part of the conversations that we were having about this were, it's not easy to kill yourself. I mean, it, we have this image of like, oh, it's just like, oh, take a couple pills. Pills are typically not very successful. Um, if you take enough medication to kill yourself, you usually vomit because your body has a lot of protective things, you know, and we don't, and most of us don't have enough medication around the house to do that, you know? I mean, and that was the thing that was almost kind of funny with my mother because my mom threw things away like on a regular basis. So she's like, go check the medicine cabinets. I'm like, you don't have anything in the medicine cabinet, <laughs> like including your EpiPen that you need, you don't have because you threw it away because it expired, you know? Um, so I think that, you know, would you, would you actually kill yourself with a firearm? Would you actually do these things? And then, I mean, to make, make the story even more, I feel like sometimes when I when I tell these stories, I'm like, I can't believe this all happened to you know my family, my mom. My mom had a good friend, and I think this was kind of her role model. Um, she had a friend who I had suspected quite some time had uh, cancer, um, and so we had gone and seen her a few times and visited her. She was about ten years older than my mom, and I was like, you know, Anne's sick. I just want you to know that I can I can see it. You know, you could see that she was sick. I knew she wasn't seeing a, a doctor. Apparently, she'd never seen a doctor in her life. Um, and I think she knew that she was sick uh, and um, she ended up getting in a car accident. And my mom called me and said, like, you know, I, I think something's really wrong with Anne. She like got in a car accident and then she refused. She didn't let the EMTs take her to the hospital. Uh, and I said, OK, you know, she that's her right. She doesn't have to go to the hospital. And she's like, well, but she's in a lot of pain and I think something's you know wrong. And so we talked about it. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure she's probably broken a hip. Um, I think mm. that's probably what happened. And I said, you know, she can go to the hospital, she can get treatment and they can't force her to stay, you know? And so my mom and I had some conversations about something called the, in California, I think it's called the most in California. Um, it's uh, medical orders for end of life or sustaining life treatment. So you can get a document that basically says what you want, right? And you put it on your refrigerator it's so that nobody, it's so the paramedics don't take you to the hospital, whatever it is that you want. So my mother got all these documents situated with her friend, got all a power of attorney, got all these things, including a will and last will and testament. And then she was hoping to take my her friend to the doctor. And her friend said, you know, I'm really tired. You know, today I'm going to take a nap. We'll talk about all this tomorrow. And my mom went home and then she just had this feeling. Right. And so then she went back and her friend had killed herself. Um, mm. Yeah. 
And so my mom, and then of course the police detained my mother. Oh no. Because, because every, there was all these documents that like left her house to my mom because she had no family. And then of course there were other documents that like said, you know, I want to be buried with my mom and dad and things like that. So they pretty quickly figured out that my mom hadn't, you know, killed her friend. Um, but I think that was like a, a, a role model, you know, for my mother. And I, I, to this day, don't know what she did. My mom found her with a bag over her head um, and likely, Jeez. yeah, likely had taken maybe some kind of sleeping medication or something like that. So, uh, you know, those are the, those are the, kind, that's a, that's a, that's a strong woman, you know, to do that alone, to do that by herself, to, to do all of those things. And I think that's, that's like when we talk about death with dignity, that's what we're talking about, that she shouldn't have had to have been alone. She should have had, to, she should have been able to Built, feel comfortable to go to a doctor and say like, this is what I think is going on. And this is how I would like to end my life. Uh, and at that time she was in California and that was not, it was not legal in California at that time. And not that she would have gone because she wasn't talking to any doctors, <laughs> you know? So, so I think that, I think that's when you're talking about those conversations, you know, that that's what you're leaving people to. Uh, you know, my mother would have not by any standard met the the criteria for death with dignity. Uh, but do I think that she had the right to do what she did? And do I wish it could have been easier than it was? Absolutely. You know. The one issue that I have is that you have to be able to administer it yourself, which I get because I can't imagine a whole lot of doctors would want to be mm -hmm. in that position. Yeah. Vets don't like that part of the job. And that's, you know, a whole different moral um quandary you know if you got a dog like the dog we lost a year ago had severe cancer he mm. and something had happened that day in the morning just it, the, the vet assumed that something ruptured inside because he went from mm -hmm. power walking even though he wasn't eating crazy little dude to not walking and he could, you could tell he was very uncomfortable and i'm like oh, nope this is it yeah um and it still was really hard to make that decision i've had to um, put down, let's see, our first dog died a natural death. Second one had cancer, so he he was euthanized. And that wasn't easy because the vet had to do extra medication because he wasn't ready to go, even though he was 12, which for a golden retriever is pretty pretty much the lifespan. Mm -hmm. The third one had cancer. The fourth one, um, he had really bad nerve arthritis in his back legs. So he ended up not being able to stand and urinate and do proper doggy things because he couldn't mm -hmm. stand up um and then we lost so number five is laying on the couch over here <laughs> and the sixth <laughs> one was he was only five and a half that was really hard it's a lot easier when they're at the end of their lifespan mm -hmm. yeah um the one thing i did with my mom and i i told my husband and my daughter who was predominantly an adult at the time you know she was in her mid-20s is if my mom got pneumonia we were just going to call hospice because my my goal with my mom was to give her as much quality of life as much joy as possible and not drag out dying from alzheimer's i mean mm -hmm. we pretty much started in 96 with not taking not writing down directions on orders and progressing into when i heard her basically shooting the breeze with a client i knew i was like i better go check and make sure i know what this girl this person wants so i had to start hovering right and then when they retired it was a relief but also um a concern because i'm like what is she going to do with herself and then my parents are going to be home all day together it's like well that ain't gonna be good so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know so it was like but i i told both of them that you know i'm telling you this is this is how i think we need to handle this but if it actually happens i don't know that i'll have the strength to not just give her an antibiotic. I mean, curing pneumonia is generally fairly easy. Mm. That never happened. Um, I did debate, well, you might, I don't know how you'll feel about this one, but <laughs> whenever she'd go to the doctor, they'd like, has she had her flu shot? Oh yes, she got it at the care home. And at the care home, I'm like, oh, she got it at the doctor. The doctor. So I'm like, <sighs> I, you know, um, I, I believe in vaccinations. I'm a Rotarian. Our goal since like 1987 has been to eradicate polio in the world. So I'm not anti-vax, but I've never had the flu or the flu shot. I did do the COVID ones overdue on 
boosters, but I work mm-hmm. in my own office with a dog. So it's like, I don't know. You know it's like, these, I would not have given my mom the COVID vaccine for her, but I would mm-hmm. have wanted to give it to her for the residents. For everybody else, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was like, I'm so glad I didn't have to make those decisions. But, you know, mm-hmm. my sister and I agree on nothing. Like, it's oh, nasty oh. and raining and windy out right now. She would probably tell me somehow that it's why that that's pleasant weather. I mean, like, <laughs> we agree on zip. <laughs> so we don't well, even see, look. We don't look related. I, Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say, and that's why these conversations are so important when somebody is with it, right? Because it's not really your decision to make or your sister's decisions to make. It's your mom and dad as decision to make and to make their their wishes clear. And I think that if you can have those conversations, it, it's still, you know, uh, there's a document called an advanced directive. And, and again, in my book, there's like lots of stuff. It's not a book, of, it's not a book intended to be a, a guide to do any of these things, but it's, it's a walkthrough of all these things that you should be talking about and should be thinking about, um, particularly end of life. But an advanced directive is basically a suggestion. Uh, it is not something that is a legally binding document. Uh, mm-hmm. So it is a document that you create that says, these are all the things that I would I would like. And if I then have to appoint a power of attorney. So my power of attorney is the person who I believe can look at this document and take these actions. So your mom would be looking at you and your sister and being like, who's the person who is the right person? And my mother chose me and, uh, you know, I don't know if this is a compliment or not, but she said, because I know you can pull the plug. Um, and she was very, you know, she was very adamant. My parents were both very adamant that they didn't, you know, want like heroic measures in the hospital. They didn't want to be on ventilators. They didn't want those things. And I don't know what made them so easy to talk about those things because they both did. And that was not me as a nurse um, because it was before I was a nurse um, that my parents were just very, very clear about those kinds of things that they didn't want those things. So I think that's, you know, I think I think that's the model that you want. You want a family where you feel comfortable and confident going into those things, knowing that that that's okay, um, and that that's what someone wants. Uh, you know, I think it's perfectly reasonable. I actually think that if you're talking about quality of life with someone with dementia putting them into a hospital pretty much under any circumstance is pretty torturous. Uh, and so, you know, there's a scene in the, the, the book that's not, not exactly what happened, but um, when my dad um, ended up in the emergency room and my dad, as I've said before, was still very strong uh, because he would forget that he exercised. So he would exercise again. Um, oh and, <laughs> yeah. So he would, you know, could probably have done a hundred pushups easy, you know, um, and, and was a strong guy to begin with it. It wasn't until probably, you know, the last three or four years of his life that he really became more frail. Um, but you know, they were trying to work with my dad. He had pretty significant dementia. He had no awareness of course, that he had dementia. He was not particularly uncooperative, but like was not going to take direction from anybody. Um, it ended up in four point restraints, you know? Um, and so was that the right way to handle it? Absolutely not. And, and, and ultimately he probably, given what was going on, probably should have never been in the hospital to begin with, but his provider wasn't pretty, wasn't particularly savvy about managing dementia and what was going on. And so, you know, that was what happened. And my dad, I probably ended up in the hospital Gosh, in the 10 years that he had dementia, I would say three or four times. And every time ended up in restraints, you know, because he couldn't cooperate and and they didn't. And, and just being on the other side of that, um, it's a very challenging situation to manage a dementia patient in a hospital unit that is not created for dementia patients. Um, because the other patients stay in their room, uh, the other patients listen, the other patients, you know, cooperate. And so you, you have this, a nurse who's got, you know, five to six patients that they're taking care of. And then they've got, you know, Mr. Smith who's wandering off out the hallway and it's their job to try to keep that person safe and do all these things. And so often it, it becomes an unmanageable situation and it depends on, you know, everything that's going on in the hospital at that given moment. So yeah, I, when my, my dad actually did die of pneumonia. Uh, so that was, he got pneumonia and the, my, the doctor basically said to my mom, you know, is this, do we want to, do we want to go to the hospital? Is that what we want to do? And my mom, you know, was like, no, I think we're, I think we're good, you know? And at that point, my dad was no longer communicative, um, you know, no, no, no longer really walking. 
um, he wasn't bed bound and I, and he did recognize my mom. I will always say that to the, to his dying day. My dad didn't, I don't know if he knew who my mom was, but he knew my mother was different than everyone else. Um, because he would look at her and still smile and give her a kiss, which, you know, he would just like, you know, grab her and give her a kiss. And so he knew in some respect who she was. He knew she was the special one. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And he, yeah, talk- he forgot me. Yeah. Did he forget you or just the relationship? Oh, he forgot me. Yeah. No, he didn't know who I was. Yeah. Because my mom thought I was her best friend. Mm. And I lost. So starting in 2010, a little bit into. So actually started in 2006. My dad's side of the family has um, significant cases of diabetes. <clears throat> and I had a client who was a doctor. She said, you have a family history of diabetes. You're overweight. You're screwed. Best thing she could have ever said is my little brain said, I'll show you. Um, mm-hmm. She's never seen me since. She does not know that I lost over 100 pounds. So I kind of knew, like, I didn't recognize the person in the mirror. So it was like, there's no way my mother is putting two mm-hmm. and two together. And so when I confirmed it, you know, and then she started telling everybody, she's my best friend. I've known her forever. I'm like, yeah, no, you think? You know? <laughs> it was just, it From was kind of forever. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You've known me the longest. You know, it's like, I would draw drop little hints but um you know it's i try to counsel people that that's likely to happen because when it does it's still kind of painful like Mm -hmm. when i confirmed my mom didn't didn't remember who i was it was my actual birthday and the community the care home had a thanksgiving feast you know buffet and it was really a feast and it was really great food And she had zero clue. And I told her, you know, oh, they're having a party. It's a special day. It's November 17th. You know, none of that rang Mm -hmm. any bells whatsoever. So I'm like, yep, she has zero clue that I'm her daughter. And it it stung a little bit, but it wasn't overly surprising. But did your parents have to take care of their parents or did your grandparents suffer at the end? So my parents are both immigrants. Um, And so my parents came, my dad was German and my mom was British. And so we were in the United States and I actually don't know. No, I mean, they didn't definitely didn't take care of them in in, in like physically they weren't there. Uh, My dad's parents, I never, I never met. Um, And I met, but don't remember my mom, my granddad on my mom's side. And then my grandmother on my mom's side, I, I do remember um, but they, no, they didn't physically take care of them financially. They took care of my grandmother. Um, but no. And I mean, and I think, and I even think there's like a European quality to what my mother did, you know, um, cause one of my friends who's is similar to me, like, you know, from European heritage, she was like, oh, that's so very like old, old European, you know, I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to stick around for this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, no, definitely didn't. And I mean, ultimately I, I didn't, you know, I didn't really take care of my dad, you know, was in assisted living. So it wasn't like we were taking care of him. Um, and then my mom, it was for a very short time. My mom was, you know, my mom was walking five miles a day before yes. she had a stroke. Yeah. yeah. Five miles a day is a lot. Oh, my mom, she was in, and, and, and that was actually what we thought was going on because my mom had dogs that um, had, it was, I, I so I, I have an essay actually in the Bellevue Literary Review kind of about this because um, I think COVID killed my mom. My mom didn't die of COVID, but my mom was in pure isolation um, and all of the things that were meaningful to her got lost in 2020. So both of her dogs died back to back. Mm. um, And that was one right prior to the lockdown and then one during the lockdown. Um, and actually that's not true because both times she couldn't go in. So just even that, not being able to go in and to drop the dogs off and then to get called to mm. say that we're they're gonna have to put the dogs down and to be in the parking. I mean, like just that. And you're talking about how hard it is to put an animal down, but then how hard it is to not be there um, and to not be able to make that choice. You know, and some people would make the choice to be there and some wouldn't, but to not be allowed to make that choice for you, what that choice was, you know, so it was all of those things. Um, and then, so she was just very, very isolated. And that was actually what we thought was happening. Cause it was about a week before the stroke happened. My mom was just making these very vague complaints. Um, you know, her feet hurt, she was tired. And, and, and I was like, okay, you know, I'm not quite sure what's, what's happening here. Cause nothing was specific enough. And then actually, again, n- another thing I, I learned from this experience, um, 
was that that's very common. They're actually beginning to feel like there's pre-signs of strokes, like things that are going on that are sort of indicating that there's, you know, something about to happen. I'm not sure what people think it is um, that's giving you those signs, but um, that might, but she didn't go, not that they, not that this would have made any difference, right? But um, she wouldn't go to a doctor because of COVID. So she wasn't, she wasn't going to COVID. And that was actually um, finally one of the things that I said was, I was like, you've just got to go. You're going to have to go to urgent care. You know, something's wrong and you're going to have to go. And that was actually the day that I told her, I said, if you're not better by Wednesday, you need to go to urgent care. And that's the day that she had the stroke was Wednesday. So she went to the emergency room instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which during co so this was early on in COVID then? Aug that was August. That was actually August, August okay. 20. Yeah. Because we so lost. Right in the middle. Um our oldest one of three at the time our oldest dog of three um the one that had really bad back legs we put him down november 25th of 2020 and we were there yeah um you know and everybody was masked which of course when you're crying and your nose is running it's was was like it i don't really, yeah yeah it was like you know it was and it was the same veterinary office but i think it was different vets from the previous dog but you know that's that's why i asked because it's just like ugh. I know how hard that would have been. I couldn't have done that with him because he was literally my Velcro dog and my shadow, my stalker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's interesting to hear that that there's kind of like pre-warnings. So my husband's on blood thinners because he's had two rounds of um, blood clots and they don't know where they're coming from. Um, the first time he was like, it was progressed, but he was like, getting fatigued easier and taking the dogs for a walk was getting harder and he was having a harder time to breathe. Um, that was in 2019 and 2021, we were cleaning out my, so my paternal grandmother lived to 103. So again, mm -hmm. I better take after my dad's side of the family. <laughs> I didn't get the diabetes, but I got the fat gene and the stubborn genes. <laughs> Although Maybe that's they're on both all on that side, right? Maybe you got uh, that. Stubborn's on both sides, but um, <laughs> I hope I, I hope I take after my Nana because she lived to 103. And it was pretty much, and 101 of those years was pretty darn, darn good. About mm -hmm. 102, she was blind from glaucoma, mostly blind from glaucoma. Then she got really super hard of hearing, which that's like, you know, isolation in your own brain. And no, thank you. I wouldn't want that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you get to 102, you know, you can't really complain. Um, but we were cleaning out her house and he was, he was doing something and his Apple watch gave him an indication that his heart rate was high. And he was, I think he was having a hard time, a little bit of hard time breathing, but you know, you're vacuuming and you're doing things. Right. And so you don't really pay attention. And then he sat down and he looked at his watch and he's like, this is not good. It didn't, the heart rate didn't come down. Mm -hmm. And so. Did he have atrial fibrillation? No, it was just oh, okay. weird blood clots yeah. okay. and just high heart rate which not really sure why blood clots cause that. You could probably explain it, but that's a whole other show. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he came home and I had a podcast recording. He said he didn't feel good. His heart rate was high. He was going to rest. I did the recording. It came downstairs. It was still high. And I'm like, dude, it is the Thursday before Memorial Day weekend. Oh, you've got to go. going. Yeah. Like, yeah. we're not mm -hmm. waiting until all the nutcases mm -hmm. crash their boats or have mm -hmm. DUIs or like heart attacks from God knows what they've been doing. You're yeah, going now. Absolutely. And, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's interesting. It's like that's that that puzzle that that clue is gonna bug me because of what his experiences were. Well, they definitely, I'm, I'm, and I and I had looked up some research. You know, this is the what if, right? So the nurse what if is like you're digging into all these research papers of like how you could have done something differently. Uh, you know, and that's and so I, I and I was really surprised too because it was it was an interesting thing to be like, oh, there's all kinds of warning signs. It's just that they're not they're so vague as to not be helpful, especially when you're you know, especially when you're dealing with someone from a distance who's calling you at a phone who can't go see anybody. You know, um, and then I think also just the the idea that like in medical care in general. General, I think that I have, a, I have a real pet peeve about like medical care on TV, you know, as opposed to real medical care, um, because I think it, it definitely gives this impression of like people who can like, you know, oh, figure out these puzzles so quickly. And it's just so easy. And a lot of times it's like, yeah, we have no idea. Like, we don't know. We really don't know. You know you're getting all this information. And you're like, well, well, maybe it's this and maybe it's that. And, you know, and I think that happens a lot more frequently than we'd like to admit. Um, and so I think that there's lots of things, you know, that like, oh, my, my legs tingle. I was like, that could have been a million 
different things. Uh, and so, you know, you, you, there was just nothing to be, there was no, infor not enough information. And actually the thing that I thought was going on, my mom had a, a very slow acting form of leukemia. And that was actually what I thought it was because all of the, all of the, the things that she was saying was like, oh, okay, lethargy, you know, she's got all this, you know, these sensations and things. I was like, I bet that's what it is. You know, I bet we're going to get her into the hospital and that's what it's going to be. And then of course that's, that's not what it was. Yeah. That's, it's never what you think it is. So, yeah. Well, that's interesting coming from somebody in the profession because I mean, I was just watching a, a doctor procedural on TV and I'm like, there's no way that like the, there was two different scenarios and I'm like, they wouldn't even attempt either one. Those. <laughs> I was just, was I was it? having total, um, one baby needed a heart transplant and one needed, um, the, like the valves, I think is the right word. Mm -hmm. And they, they only have one heart. Oh, gosh. so they basically yeah. had to take the heart out of the baby. The one that needed the tran the new heart, take his heart out and then somehow dissect the valves yeah. and give it to the other baby and give him the new heart all in like a tiny right, little, a tiny little thing. two and a half right, hour yes. window, which right, of course yeah. they get to like two hours and 29 minutes and, and 30 seconds. it's all the seconds. same doctors in the same hospital doing all this work, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Down, <laughs> down the hall. Um, and the other one was a guy had a, a tumor that was, um, was on the brain stem, in the brain, and it was, it infiltrated the brain stem. And mm. they did this gruesome surgery where they went up through the um, oral cavity and through his nasal mm. cavity. And they managed to like pop the thing out whole. And I'm like, that didn't no happen. way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, it, right, I, yeah. was, I was just yeah. watching that thinking, God, I hope nobody ever thinks that's true because right. that's right. just baloney. So one quick last question. So your okay. mom, your mom decided she was just going to stop eating. Mm -hmm. Did you have to give her like comfort meds? Cause I know I get nasty if I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so what so so she met the definition of hospice um and i don't and it is it is it is legal it's been like um I, and again another thing i learned from this experience uh was i actually had to google it i was like is she allowed to do this like is someone going to come in and say she's not allowed to do this like i don't know like it, this is basically committing suicide right uh and so the i guess the supreme court and i don't remember what year it was but the supreme court has come in and said yes that's like someone's right to not eat a drink and to do that um and so the thing that that actually got her on hospice um was that she stopped taking her medication so she was refusing to take all of her medications and so then by that definition, that made her at very high risk for a stroke. And then they said that, that by that definition, she met the definition of hospice. So then it was only it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I think hospice came. And then Thursday was when we got the medication. So it was three days that she didn't eat or drink um, before she got any medications. And then, you know, the last conversation that we had, I said, you know, do you want to be alert? Or do you want to be you know, just like, like asleep enough that we can still communicate or just asleep. And she was like, asleep, you know, I want to just do that. And so that's, that's what I did. And then that was, that was Thursday and she died on the Tuesday after that. Wow. You've had some seriously interesting experiences. <laughs> well, I mean, that's not even my nursing experience. So that's like, yeah. yeah. And so yeah. you must have 14 other books in you. Well, yeah. I would hope. I know I have a couple more for sure. So, well, I can tell you that House on Fire was riveting, and I read a lot. So that's I'm not I'm not trying to butter you up, but that was a really good. You can book. butter me up as much as you want. I would love to hear it. Yes, sure um, no, I really really enjoyed it. So I highly recommend all the readers or the readers, the listeners. It's getting late in the day. The listeners should definitely check it out because, um. I did not remember that it was fiction, so mm -hmm. I was like, I thought it was true. So I, mm -hmm. but knowing some of the backstory makes it even more riveting. <laughs> so I guess the bottom line is we need to have all these charming conversations with our families while we still can. Don't Absolutely. leave these decisions up to your loved ones. That's so mean. Um, it's I I preach that a lot. I I preach mm -hmm. don't leave your full house to your loved ones i hear some oh, goodness, my husband's yes. a real estate broker people will say i'm just gonna leave this mess to my kids and i look at them and say please don't because yeah. when you have to go through somebody's house while you're grieving it's 10 times worse mm -hmm. absolutely yeah so yeah, yeah don't yeah. make them make tough decisions on your stuff 
or your body or anything. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. This was a fascinating conversation. And like I said, the book was riveting. So I'm looking forward to more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I do have my next books coming out this year. So hopefully uh, I have a very different topic, but yeah, still. I, it does have a lot of end of life stuff in it again. So that's interesting. That's certainly a topic <laughs> that I was just thinking. It does definitely have that in it. So yeah. well, you'll have to let me know. And when it comes out, I'll make sure that that book is also linked in the show notes because I do link books in the show notes so people don't have to remember. You can just click the hot link in the on the in the player oh, go right to it. Yeah, super easy. You're not going to regret reading this one. Like Great. I said, I read Thank a lot of so books. So. Thank you. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.